So what is it exactly we're listening to? What? What is it exactly we are listening to? We are listening to Evil Dead. Are you kidding me? Oh, okay. Are you recording right now? Yeah. That's cool. I want to get to saying that. Evil Dead? So, what do you got, the whole movie on there? No, it's a tiny thing. That's just how you get psyched up for a day's work. It's actually... It's actually my ringtone. <laughs> I have a ringtone. I know. It's the long-awaited return of the Mad Dog Movies podcast. In this episode, John and I are joined by FX creator Michael Del Rosa. Before we begin, I should mention that there is a short section about halfway through where our main mic stopped recording. Fortunately, I had an iPhone backup running, uh, which actually sounds pretty good. I considered cutting that section out, but really, it's not that bad. So, sit back and enjoy our conversation with Michael Del Rosa of Multivision Effects. This is, uh, what's the today's date, the 10th? Uh, today is the 10th. January 10th? Yeah. Yes. Of 2013. 2013. We all survived. I am here. My name is John Vincent, and I'm here with uh, Mike Boas, and we are now starting up our podcasting again. Uh, if you'd like to say hello, Mike. Sure. Hello. Welcome back. Today we have a very special guest. His name is Mike Del Rosa. He's uh, from Los Angeles. Uh, he's from the East Coast originally, and we've known each other for a number of years, going back at least, I think, 20 years. We uh, worked on a film called After Image, uh, which starred the wonderful uh, John Mellencamp, as yeah. I say sarcastically. What, uh, what year was Fletcher. What year was that? That was 2000. Oh, wow. Okay. I remember because I was married in the middle of the production. I oh. had to take two days off to get married. Huh. Okay. And, uh, and for those people who have been following Mind Rip, uh, there's a connection there. The One of the lead actresses in our film. Oh, Kristen Royal, yes. Kristen Royal, and she was also oh, one right. of the victims in the film After Image. Mm -hmm. She was only 13 at the time, too. And she's actually not uh, not that bad of an actress. She's quite good. No, and, she's great. And she's been doing really well. And we filmed quite a bit uh, for Mind Rip in the opening, for the opening 30 minutes of it. But uh, we're in the process of putting that together and, and shooting some pickup shots. And we will post and you'll be able to see her uh, in action. Mm -hmm. You like how the introduction uh, I know. turned into John talking about Mike. Well, yeah, well it's, I was always here I, today. I, I, I know, remember. but, but <laughs> I was going to say it's always about us. <laughs> <laughs> and what we're doing, people are interested in Mind Rip. They don't know who the hell Mike Del Rosa is. That are, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not really. Uh, but Mike, Mike also has also worked and done us a favor by doing us a few things oh, done you more on, uh, on Mind Rip. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, and and maybe, maybe some, to, some to come. You know, it Hopefully. depends. Yep, yep. We're know. looking forward to it. Actually, actually, in all seriousness, Mike is very talented. And so. he's worked on some very big... Movies, uh, a lot of small movies, big movies, like a lot of people. Uh, one of the ones currently is a show called Bite Me, which is which is on the Machinima yes. uh, Network. Right? Machinima. Machinima. But uh, uh, why, why don't we have Mike talk about it? Uh, why don't you basically give us a little history of how you got started, maybe the first couple of jobs you did, and how you ended up where you are now? Well, you know what's odd is actually one of the first jobs I ever uh, um, got was here, and and you were on set. Um, in fact, I think you tried to steal my job when you were no, there. No, I actually had the job before you. Oh, okay. That's, that's what it was. Yes, yes that, right. that's what it was. And then this young, uh, fresh-faced kid came walking in, like, oh, he's going to do all the bullet hits. And, uh -huh. and and I remember that. I was like, God, I hate that guy already. Yeah, well, yeah. you had a right to I know, right? <laughs> but um, no, uh, it was uh, uh, a little film called Minja's Alley shot right here in good old Rochester, New York. Yeah, and they ended up yeah. changing the name to what? Moving Target, I think, yeah. ultimately. <laughs> but um, you, were, you were talking about uh, we how you got how you got started and uh, uh, how you ended up where you are now? Um, well, I, I actually started with a, an interest in film, obviously, um, when I was young. And I actually uh, got a hold of my dad's Super 8 uh, um, camera, like a lot of kids, and tried to do stop motion animation. It was horrible. But I mean, uh, I tried doing claymation and. And I did it actually in a fish tank. And I think all <laughs> Peter I mean, Jackson. He yeah. did start doing. Yeah, but his was thing. probably you know coherent and good. <laughs> and probably had the sensibility of putting the camera on a tripod. Oh, it's My hard work. to do stop motion handheld. It is. I can assure you. Yeah, and it was. It was. Uh, and 
in a fish tank, no less, because they had to swim. I don't know why. But uh, I guess even starting off then, I made things extremely difficult for myself. I think we all did that, though. Yeah. I, 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 mean, I, did, I, yeah, I did stop motion with a video camera. Uh, yeah, I tried that as and, well. Yeah. yeah, and you turn, you hit the button on and off, and, and it, it goes kunk, 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 kunk. And I, 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 no yeah. tripod, so I'm doing camera moves, too, by like mm. pivoting the camera. I started out doing it. I saw Jason the Argonauts, and I had a camera left, that was left to the family from my grandfather. It was regular rate. Ooh. Not even Super 8, it was regular 8, which was essentially a 16 millimeter film that you ran through the camera, and when that was exposed, you flipped it over, you ran it through again, so it exposed one side of the film and the other. You sent it off to the yeah, lab, and it, they tech- Slice it down the middle, right? Yeah. Wow. And on the camera, you'd have to click it really fast to get the one frame. Mm. So, but anyway, continue. Um, well, I mean, from there, I, I had an interest in horror films, and uh, I think that the... the f- my inspirations actually started with uh, uh, magazines. Um, my recollections were reading creepy magazines at a very early age, perhaps a little too young to be reading creepy magazines in particular, <laughs> because those aren't intended really for, for children if you, if you uh, look at the uh, stories and the, the, um, no, the violence. They, of them. they weren't. I remember no, looking at those no. myself. And um, again, it's, it's not necessarily the, uh, um, like I, I, was, I wasn't really into famous monsters, oddly enough. My generation was more of the Fangoria. I started off with Fangoria early on. And in fact, I remember my first time ever seeing a Fangoria. Um, there was a uh, small market that was uh, around where we lived, and uh, I was begging my father for, the, for this issue. And this t- sticks out in my mind to this day. It was the issue with uh, Motel Hell, with the guy with the chainsaw. Right, right, right. right. Uh, and, and I begged him and begged him. And, be- and don't Farm, you know? Farmer Vincent. Farmer yes. Vincent. But don't you know that's yes. the one, the one uh, ep- or, uh, magazine that's worth like $300 now? Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's the one. I, and for some reason, I think it's because of the cover. Because oh, of the, I was going to say, I had, the I had all the first issues of Starlog and Fangoria, yeah. and I didn't think they were worth anything. Well, that one in particular, because I think That's the cover, why they're worth something, yeah. because no one thought they were worth anything. Right. Well, the, the cover yeah. also, I think, is the one that caught a lot of flack, because it had the chainsaw and the blood and the pig oh, head and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of ahead of its time, Fangoria. And no it, was ahead of a, it was ahead of a pig. Yeah, ah, of a yes. Pig. In fact, the, <laughs> I was one of the few people that used to read that magazine when I was in high school. Oh. And I ended up getting the nickname Fangoria. Wow. So kids would actually call me that. They named you after a whole magazine? They, yes. Well, you know what? Where I went to school, kids weren't all that bright. <laughs> but that's what, you know. Well, you know. <laughs> they weren't bright at mine either. It wasn't my idea to call No offense something. to anyone at Gates Chile through Gates the years. Well, yeah, I tried growing up in Henrietta, see what happens. Chris, Na- was just Chris Nakis, who was a producer, mm. uh, went to Henrietta too, and that's all I got to say about yeah. that. <laughs> Well, we know about him. <laughs> Actually, we love Chris. Chris is Chris guy. is uh, is amazing. He's an amazing guy. Well, we're going to have a new game, but Chris has has been involved with a number of uh, feature film productions around here did, that we've all worked on. Did you forget the word failed feature? No, 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 I'm, no kidding. Failed. Hey, I'm kidding. But he's been he's like he's been actually in them in various parts, and he's That's either true. guy he's in, either inside the makeup or he's a character or he's got a hood over his head and he's running through it. So I'm gonna have Mike tell you what we're gonna do. Yeah, well, uh, certainly on, on uh, DVDs of, of these features, we wanna do extras that are spot the nakus extras. <laughs> and so, it's like so, a game. Yeah. So I like it, this. It, it turned it into a drinking game perhaps. Ooh. And yeah, you know, we have, uh, yeah, the, the, at the last screening, you know, I, I was leaning over to, there's Nakus, there's Nakus, there's Nakus and, and yeah. every, every time he'd show up. But it was, uh, yeah, he probably played eight roles in that. Uh, yeah, a, a movie we all worked He's on. Awesome. Mike did some uh, uh, blood hits and some old age makeup on a film called uh, 3.14, which mm-hmm. is uh, oh, yeah. kind of trying to get into the uh, festival circuit now. And uh, Chris was in that a lot. Yeah, he was. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, on one scene, we have him running. We had to have someone running across in the out, outside in the dark. And yeah, we just needed a shot of someone We just went shot. Yeah, it was, it was wet out. It was raining out. And it was a real quick lighting set up outside. And uh, we're inside this girl's room shooting out the window. And so we had to say, all right, Chris, all right, go ahead. Keep running back and forth. So just, 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 to, just to get him, I, after I called cut and I was telling everybody to take all the stuff down, I kept telling him to keep running. So everybody's like taking the gear out. We're still having Chris running back and forth out in the rain. <laughs> well, I'm surprised he actually did it with clothes on. <laughs> I know. That's, that's the yeah, he has like, a pension yeah. for getting naked. Yeah. <laughs> that's the name Nakis. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, Let's go bring us right back to where we were. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so you were You bought saying, some Fangorias. You bought some okay. Fangorias. You went out west. Well, fangorias. no, no, no. Actually, my father wouldn't <laughs> b- purchase that one in particular for me. That's the one, ironically, that's worth you know, yeah, a right. bunch of money. 
But anyways, uh, so I, yeah, um, Fangorious, uh, Creepy Magazines, uh, this was like how I uh, formulated my idea of what horror is, horror film, um, you know, uh, through Fangoria and, um, you know, early 80s horror films and that type of thing. Um, Evil Dead. Oh yes, Evil Dead. Because I'm such a fan, and they they they've done a remake. This is 2013, and and at first, I mean, I, I'll just we'll just get this briefly, quickly out of the way. 2013, they they are going to release this um, a remake of of a favorite movie of mine, Evil Dead. And I, I'm a huge fan of the original, um, and I was actually I wanted to dislike it because a lot of remakes are not done very well, mm. and, and they, most, they yeah most of them aren't. Yeah, done and right. it really does break the heart because when when you when you're a fan of something that they've made perhaps produced in the 80s or whatever, and then you go and you watch this, and it's like, I mean, all this time has elapsed, and couldn't they make it better? You would think, right? Mm. But I mean, Evil Dead, we I mean. I just uh, the trailers that have been out. I think it looks really, really good. I and hope I think, so. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I hope so. I hope so too. I hope I'm not being misled because obviously they put the best things in the trailer sometimes or whatever. But I think there's going to be a lot more that that isn't in the trailer. They're using the same mantra as us too, which is mm-hmm. no CGI. They're yeah. doing everything practically. practically. It looks, it looks, you know, serious. It it's does. Not, it doesn't look campy. That's like, what and I like. And that's that. Some people are like, oh, but Evil Dead should be, you know, kind of funny. And I, well, no. the original was the ultimate experience in grueling terror. Yes. Now, and, and, and uh, if you watch the original, people people only kind of know him from like uh, Part Two mm-hmm. or even Army of Darkness, which are campy. Yeah. But the first one is is dead serious, and, and that's the way I well, like there, it. There are laughs, perhaps, the, but, some, but yeah. unintentional. I yeah. would imagine. Now, Evil Dead Two was 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 played a yes. lot for for the humor. Right. Yes. Right on purpose. Yeah. On yeah. purpose. Yeah. Because they wanted to get a better rating. But if you watch the first one, it's far more intense. I think it's it's a little bit more mean. I saw it. I saw mm-hmm. it when it first came out in the theater. I yeah, saw I did too. That. It was it was me, mm-hmm. a, a, a friend of mine, my sister, and one old guy way in the front, and that was it. Mm-hmm. But it was awesome. I saw Evil Dead. In the movie. I mean, not many people can say that. But then, are we dating ourselves? I mean, I, I don't. Know, I never I mean, dated you. Did I, you I, ever date me? I don't think so. You I did. I don't remember. I remember that myself. <laughs> but um, to to have seen that in the movie theaters was awesome. I mean, that was yeah. yeah. That was yeah. I remember not knowing what to expect. Um, I had read a little bit about it, knowing that they had done it on the on for a very low budget. They had gone door to door, basically trying to raise money for it, and that's was my dream was to make a film like that. And uh, I was pretty impressed when I saw it as a kid. I wasn't that young. I was like, I think I must have been 18 years old. But uh, yeah, yeah, 83. Yeah. Finish what you're saying. <clears throat> I don't even remember now. Oh God. So you see what? Evil Dead. You say this is my oh, deal. Oh, that's right. And yes. Then, uh, and then uh, well, we do drift e- each time away. <laughs> but um, uh, the Evil Dead series. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just saw a lot of horror films. I mean, it was it was the thing to do. I think also my, in particular, my parents uh, like mentally scarred me in many ways. <laughs> but, but the one that actually kind of had been somewhat beneficial is they took me to inappropriate movies. I mean, you don't take a kid to go see The Shining when he's about the age of little Danny there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, and you know, just the, so yeah. I I think the. Uh, and yeah, mine was the corpse grinders. My parents took <laughs> oh, yeah. corpse grinders yeah, at the drive-in. I remember. Th- this will be a good movie. one for little Johnny. Yeah, yeah here you go. Hey. Don't look at the screen. Turn was, your head away. Did they try to cover nothing. your eyes and stuff? No, I was no, no, inside no, a little. Yeah. with a VW, you know, uh, a little Beetle. And my sister and I are in the back seat and we uh, saw this. And that and the trilogy, not trilogy of terror, the yeah. one where Santa Claus. <laughs> Goes around killing people. Yep. Oh, uh, and then, you know, the Silent Night, Tales from the Crypt. Night. Tales from the Crypt. Yes. Yeah, it was like a double feature. I remember that. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so like, I'm trying. I'm trying to. Turn. You're you're wrong. No, no, it's Tales from the Crypt. It's the it's first three episode. Stories. The first episode of Tales from the Crypt, the TV show, had the killer Santa Claus. No, no, it was a movie. It was a, Tales it was from a, the Crypt. The that's a remake. The, the, the amicus. That's the amicus remake. picture that had Tales from the Crypt did not. Wait, yes. Did it? Yeah, yeah, it because it had the, the, the uh, uh, famous uh, actress with the dark hair. What's her name? Uh, they're all Black. like. They're all Black. Black. No, 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 no. no. Uh, Collins, right? Yes. Yeah. John Collins. John, John Collins. Collins. Yes. Did it have killer Santa Claus in it too? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Welcome to the crypt. You are invited on a guided tour of a world of darkness, where nightmares become reality. Who's next? Perhaps you? 
I'm remembering the Peter Cushing she kills part. Her I'm remembering the guy with all the razor blades. Yes. Yeah, the razor yep. blades. Yeah, yeah, that's the same one. That's one of the yeah. first movies I remember seeing For as a kid. Yeah, me too. Oh, yes. Me too. That was a How horror movie. strange. I wonder if we saw yeah. it together in different cars. Was it the, was it the drive-in you saw? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that, it was funny, but, yeah. at the drive-in theaters. That's funny. In fact, I, re I recollect having and a little The fact that we're actually saying drive-ins actually dates us pretty well. Yeah. I wouldn't well, I saw a lot of movies at the drive-in, though. I mean, yeah. I saw, that's where I saw Dawn of the Dead. I saw the Phantasm at the drive-in, too. Yeah. Those are the right movies to see yeah. at the drive-in, I would think. But the movies were different back then because it, it felt like like my cousin would would tell me about something he might have seen, and just him even in a, a kid telling a kid, yeah, it's like the, it created the, like the story in, in your mind that um, still to this day is like it's something. It, it's it's um I don't know how to put it, but it's it's kind of a. Like the fantasy you you suspect a movie's going to be, and then you go to see it like in the movie theaters back then. It was it was something rewarding. It's mm -hmm. like uh, well, yeah. I think a lot of that's kind of um, there's a lot of creativity even in yeah. the low budget stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. even the story wise and and and, and visual wise. I mean, yeah, I, I think uh, Night of the Living Dead is a prime example. Uh, of that, where you, there was a big payoff. When what you I, went soft what I like particularly that. like about that movie is there's a sense of paranoia and there's a sense of feeling like mm -hmm. like there's um, it almost feels like even though it's only at this farmhouse, I love the shots where they they show the news footage because it yeah. gives a sense of feel like it's happening everywhere. It's mm -hmm. it's like you know, and mm -hmm. and to me, it's like that was one of the um, the mistakes of uh, say like the remake or something is that giving that sense of it's happening everywhere kind of yeah. a thing. The and, Dawn and of the Dead remake I thought was good for the first twenty minutes. It was good. It was a good one. Yeah. You know, but and then after that, I just I just couldn't get into it too much. I, I just the the thing that uh, there's certain things. It's like if you're a purist, you know, I mean, and I, I hate to never say never, but it's like you know the whole thing with, with zombies that run run and that type of thing. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. It's, I mean, it's a okay. different. It's a different thing. Yeah, yeah, it, it yeah. is. But I mean, it's like to me, it's like sometimes you break something like the, like almost a rule, and it's like. Uh, even though there should be no rules in filmmaking, but I mean, it just feels like sometimes you do stuff like that. If they're doing it just for the sake of breaking a rule, then it's it's kind of, um, it doesn't really serve the purpose. And not only that, I think it kind of uh, pulls you away from what makes them creepy. It's creepy like because they do I kind agree. of gang up on you. And right, suddenly slowly. That's, yeah. that's what I found really scary. Yeah. I, I was never afraid of much in terms of going to the movies and stuff, but the, the couple of movies that did frighten me were, were a couple of the George Romero films, uh, The Thing, Ooh, yes. And uh, you know all those movies. It was actually a slow progression to to and, and within the movie of getting scared, and then the, the the sense of these zombies slowly mm -hmm. walking towards you. And even though you can run and get away from them, they're just still slowly. Yeah. And there's more of them, and they don't stop. But and they a, just keep coming, and, and it doesn't matter what you, you do. It, it, yeah. And it always seems like there's a point where the, the the character, for some reason or another, can't necessarily run around them. Right. And whatever happens, say like, I get the gas tank, the thing explodes, blah blah blah. There's something that kind of slows them up for that that momentary thing where they're you know they have their weak moment and then they get them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost more predatory, you know what I mean? In, right. in a way, sort of. Well, they both. I mean, it's funny because uh, the thing and Night of the Living Dead both have this point at which they, they've got a plan it's all going to be fine and then the worst thing happens the, 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 the truck catches on fire mm -hmm. or they lose you know they, uh, I can't remember there's, a, there's a, certainly a couple points in the thing where yeah. oh crap we're not going to solve this problem and, and yeah. get out of this alive the only thing we can do is kill yeah. it and ourselves right. Alien Alien is an example of that scared the hell out of me mm -hmm. in the movie theater the first Alien very slow-paced film. I mean, not a lot of action going on. I never saw it in the movie theater. Oh, I was 12 when I saw it in the movie theater. I went to and see it, e. was, it was the only... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. it came out at the same time. Yeah. Around at the same time. Yeah. Uh, that was the only movie that I was having a hard time looking at the screen on, actually. It got me so nervous. Mm. And you compare that to movies made today, which are so kinetic, and just keep going, just barrage you with one thing after another. And, and you watch Alien, it's very slow. The camera moves mm -hmm. in. You know, very slowly. It's a really nice buildup. There's only one major violent scene in that whole film, and that's with a chest buster. Yeah. The rest of the movie plays up on that, and you never really see anything majorly violent after that, but it scared the hell out of me. Yeah. It's so great, too, because it's like some of the, I mean, the way they set that up, it's like even the actors didn't even know it was coming. Oh, like, right, Veronica right, right. Cartway yeah. fell, fell over her couch and stuff. And like, <laughs> the, the I mean, how could you yeah. not? I mean, they're setting up this, you know, whatever they walk them in. It's yeah. this guy, John Hurt, popped through a table. I've heard that story. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> how did you not know what was going to happen? Well, they, what they did was they took the, yeah. the, the blood tubes and they actually aimed them at the actors. Yes, yeah, because yeah. you can see it, like, comes right yeah. up at her, yeah. her Which face. Which they didn't realize that was going to happen. Uh, 
Wow, that's good. Yeah. It's always a good thing to do. I had so, to all right, so, so you know, you grew up, you saw these films. Yes. And how did they, you, they influence you? And then what did you do after that? How did these uh, mold what you were... Did you do stuff in high school? Did you? Yeah, absolutely. But I think in the beginning, um, going back a little bit, um, I think the initial um, movie, seeing these movies, scared the hell out of me. And as a kid, I had, like, nightmares. So mm -hmm. I think I think the only way to mentally, like, get a grasp on it is to understand it and delve into it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's funny, too, because growing up, I didn't have a lot of friends who were necessarily into horror films. I mean, they were casual, casual interest. Sure. Uh, but me, of course, I just delved into it. And um, to me, it was like, you know, that, that's what my whole thing was wrapped around. And um, so needless to say, uh, being a, a loner in high school, um, but uh, I mean, I did have that one interest and that in filmmaking. Um, I took a television or radio broadcasting course to get into, um, you know, understanding the equipment and how to... Uh, did you find other people that had similar interests to, with you at that age or was that difficult? Well, again, it wasn't necessarily like, like again, if it was a horror interest, they, they were their interests were casual. It was passing. It wasn't like they were like right. into it as much as I was. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had the same um, issue. There was like me and yeah. one other person that they mm -hmm. had any kind of interest. And or if you wanted to quote unquote make a movie, you right. know, with your, your video camera or something, you might get a couple buddies together, but their, their interests might be waning you know yeah. and then they they would probably like oh yeah after half a day they're tired <laughs> i hear my mother calling me i gotta go right but uh uh you know i, I would expect you guys aren't taking this seriously <laughs> a little uh, mini uh, uh hitler director back then but um uh, it's uh it uh but I, I mean i would do like experiments with effects um i mean i, I special makeup effects was something that um always interests me and uh i I, I don't know. I, I guess I approached it a little bit differently. Uh, in, in the very beginning, I had this very elitist attitude. Like, it, like I couldn't uh, uh, sculpt, say, a Freddy mask, or I couldn't do something that's already been done. It has right. to be has to be pure. It has to be something. And something then, original, something. From exactly. You. And then through the years, I realized, well, you know what? At, when you understand the concept of design and designing, it's like everything is a reference of something. Mm -hmm. So it's I'm not to say that you go and you, you rip off something necessarily, but even if you use well, nature, if you did, you'd be Brian De Palma. Yeah, exactly. That's another story. <laughs> but, <laughs> but say you're designing a makeup effect or a character or creature for a movie, you, you, you take things from nature. I mean, that's reference. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. you can use other things from, from other people's bodies of work, not, not necessarily like you know, lifting directly, mm -hmm. but I mean, things that are inspirational, Some, something that has a feeling, something that, that emotes. So um, what was the first thing that you remember doing that you thought was, wow, I can really do this and go into it as a profession? When did it go past being a hobby and an interest to something? Well, I'm going to try to make a living at it. Oh, well, I mean, it's weird. I, I got a call from a friend of mine who was working on, oddly enough, uh, Night of the Demons Part 3. And um, they were shooting it up in uh, uh, Montreal, Canada. And actually, there's there's um, a book coming out, and they wanted to, they're going to do an interview. Uh, I'm one of the few people who have photographs and some information and some stories oh. of, um, yeah, some of the, the antics and the... Uh, uh, that was my first hmm. professional movie working on would be Night of the Demons Part 3. And um, so we went up to, I went up to Montreal, Canada, um, more Quebec area. It was French, uh, the French Republic there. Yeah. And um, we shot there. And uh, it, uh, it's weird because it's one of those experiences where it's so intense and you, you're working, say, like 22 hours. You go back to the hotel, you're tired. I mean, had I known years later and had that experience, I would have been like, what am I doing? And just turn around <laughs> and never have, but, but. To me, it was like, okay, I'm working, working on one of the Night of the Demons movies. Yeah. How mm -hmm. cool is that? It's like, okay, yeah. it's part three. It's one of the first things I'm ever being professionally yeah. asked to do. I, I drove all this way. I'm applying makeup right there. And Amila <laughs> Kincaid and, yeah. you know, the characters are all there. And, and Very uh, exhilarating just yeah. to, to finally yeah. get to your, your you, know, you know, what you've been playing with and, yeah. and working on as a hobby and watching these movies and then make the connection that, oh, I'm actually part of this part thing. of the system, and what I'm doing is actually going to be seen by a bunch of people, yeah. like that. I, what I was watching, and I would follow yeah. magazines mm -hmm. and read about these people, and then yeah. all of a sudden, then you're you're part of that. You're lore. part of that whole thing, yeah. and it's a it's a whole shift in mentality, and it's very very exhilarating. I found for myself. Oh God, yeah, gives you gives you reason to keep going. Yeah, it's it's almost a rush. It's like and, and people. Um, it's funny. Like uh, I I. I make sure whenever I have someone working with me doing effects or whatever, that they're credited. Um, to anyone that I might have missed, I apologize. <laughs> but um, I mean, I always make it a point, and I've, I've worked for people before in the past where you know you don't get credited for something. And it's, it's I'll tell you something, yeah, we could all raise our hand on that oh, one. Oh 
yeah. I mean, I've saved people's, you know, whole done whole shows for people, and then you you look at the credits, and it's their company. I mean, I understand right. the mentality. Oh, I hired you; it's mine. But it's like, you know what? The least someone can do is give you a credit, because to me, that's almost an indelible mark in film history. That is an indelible thing. Someone go go back for whether a, a good movie or a bad movie, go back and look at someone's name and go, oh, look, okay, John Vincent worked on this. Michael Del Rosa worked on this. Yeah. Mike Bose. I had that. Pro- I had that happen. You know? with Freak. That movie Freak. Yeah. I, and, it, and it's kind yeah. of a deflating thing when it does happen, and when you you put in an effort for someone, and sometimes it's for someone else, and for usually virtually nothing. And you know, yeah. and then you the least they can do is make sure that they give you uh, some sort of credit. And all they have to do is put in a phone call. Trust me. Well, I did, it's I, like I, I've I, done it. I've had I, call I productions. Spent, and spent weeks uh, <clears throat> designing and building the stop motion armature for uh, the animated uh, shoe sequence in Freaked. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there was a group of us working on doing other. I did that. And some, obviously, other people did other stuff. And the production is the the PAs. Got credit. Yeah. They were helping us out. And I, service. Yeah. And I did. <laughs> I didn't. I don't know if it was an oversight. If someone had had gotten mad at me for something. Yeah. Well, but, one uh, consolation these days is IMDb. You can yeah. at least. So I am you, on you IMDb. You at least put before, your own yeah. credits in. Um, but yeah, it's it's it's. I've had some people say where they actually had trouble putting credits in there because for one reason or another their name didn't appear on there. Or they didn't, they didn't have the evidence. Yeah. But what's weird yeah. is I, I, I think find, if you have a track record yeah. on other projects, yes, right, it yeah. makes it a little bit easier. Well, I find like now I'll go on there and stuff will be already on there that I we haven't even completed. You know, I'm like, oh, oh okay. someone else, is, <laughs> someone else is there ahead of yeah, you. Yeah, they're like, oh, oh, I'm getting hired for this. Oh. Yeah, well, that's cool. <laughs> that's but, another uh, thing. If you really want, you uh, want to see a list of, of uh, the movies that uh, Mike Del Rosa has done, you can go on the uh, IMDb oh, and yeah. punch his name in, and uh, a lot of that will show up. You want? Should I do the correct spelling? So make sure. <laughs> yes, give them give give them the correct yeah. spelling of your name so they know. Well, obviously it's Michael, but the last name is capital D E L space capital R O S S A. Uh, so you can go on right now while you're listening to this and, and check out exactly what he's done. It's it's a lot. It's pretty extensive. Or the website. Incredible. The website's a lot of fun. Well, give me your mm-hmm. website too. Oh yeah, you know I'll give them. I'll give that out. Should yeah, go ahead. Okay, it's, <laughs> mul- it's multivisionfx.com. Yes, I will. It's m u l t i v i s i o n f x dot com. Uh-huh. And of course, we'll have that up too uh, on the on the site, so yeah. you'll be able to to read it. Oh, definitely. So the first thing I, I don't know, I met you a few years ago uh-huh. uh, through John, and at that point, you had just recently done the Fallen Ones, which I had seen. Sci Fi Channel. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that was that's the, actually the going mummy, back a while now. The Mummy movie, right? Yeah. And uh, and that was the point where. Maybe you'd worked on Van Helsing at that point uh-huh. and some other things, but I was like, The Fallen Ones? I had, I own that DVD. And I, I went back and watched <laughs> the extras and saw you in the extras again. I was like, oh, okay. That's funny. This mummy is one of the Nephilim. They were the offspring of fallen angels and human women. He is one of the angels that God sent to destroy Sodom. We will all be destroyed. By a great deluge of water. Get your gun! I hit it. I think it pissed it off. Nice drive. Get in. I haven't got to shoot anything yet. You are going to fail. But I have to try on That's what I do. This can't be happening. It is. Giant mummies, fallen angels, all of it. That's that's one of those jobs where, and you've done a few things, where you end up doing maybe a lot yeah. on a small production uh-huh. versus a little on a big production. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. and uh, I think Samurai, what was it? Samurai, Samurai Avenger, yeah, for my that, good friend Karando Mitsutaki. I love that one. Dear friend of mine. I but, still have your DVD of that. Oh, you do? I, yeah. I, I, well, it looks like you're trading it back and forth. <laughs> yeah, what's what we do? <laughs> Mostly I, I borrow them from Mike because he's, yeah. he's got a lot of them. But yeah, It's we, a fun movie. You know, it's, it's, I enjoyed it a yeah. lot. Yeah, I think, I think it was exactly the kind of sort of trashy, you know, action, western... Samurai mashups shooting out of yeah. people, and yeah. But you ended up having to do tons on that. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and you probably just it, are you reusing the same bucket of blood over and over? No, again? I mean we went through like I don't know, like fifty gallons of blood on that thing. But I mean it was it was it was for the the love of my friend Corando. It really was. Mm-hmm. I mean it wasn't about. I mean whatever you know, whatever he had, I we were willing to make it happen for him right. just because it was it was fun. Gave you permission to be out here. Someone 
will surely take him out. I was told they'll just be the blind man. Samurai Avenger, the blind wolf. This time, revenge is blind. I mean, when you look at the effects, they're, they're kind of over the top. They're a little cheesy, but it, it's, it was intentional. Uh, again, I think part of part of one of my philosophies is when I get a screenplay and I'm doing a breakdown, or if I'm talking to a director, and I, I begin to get a feel for what the material is. I, I do not want to make effects necessarily stand out in the sense of, uh, oh, here's something I did for your film. It's mm -hmm. more, okay, here's your film, and I'm going to do effects that, that will fit your, your project. Right. Like, back in the day, I felt like, um, you know, maybe uh, effects were, and it's kind of cool that, you know, you would go to a certain effects guy to get a certain look. That's cool. But, I mean, to me, it, it seems like it, it, it's, it's more of a, a service to the film if you can make your effects and everything augment and work with the project. Right. And I, that's one thing that I've always, a philosophy I've always worked towards to try and make sure that we've, we integrate into each and every project and in, in whichever fashion, whether it's uh, hyper-realistic, uh, like some of the stuff for After Image back in the day, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then, um, uh, you know, like the Samurai Avenger over the top. Yep. Um, and then somewhere in between, although comical, is some of the stuff with... Um, uh, the the fallen ones. Right. What's your, what's what uh, project are you most proud of? Well, I'll tell you. No, I, I mean it's it's funny. Um, it's uh, are we talking the film itself, or are we talking well, like the, the stuff we produced for the film? Because um, I mean, there's a difference. You know, well, it's, yeah, there is a difference. Yeah. What what is it that you were most proud of when you, if someone asks you? So what have you worked <laughs> on? What's the first thing that comes to your mind to tell them? Oh wow. Um, I don't know. It, it, I mean, there's, there's 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 so many different things. I mean, I I was gonna say the fallen ones, but only because I was really proud of the way that we were able. To, I mean, I, I started with the intention of I wanted to make the mummies look like real mummies. Mm -hmm. like I, I I didn't want them to look like a wrapped up in all this you know gauze or whatever to hide the fact that we didn't have a suit or whatever. My intentions were to make it look, look like a real mummy, and I think for for all intents and purposes, if you go back and watch that movie. It's the one thing when you see the shots of the the, the real people in the suit, they look you know, they look good. Yeah, they look really good. Contrast to the, some of the CG oh, stuff. Horrible. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you know, I, I you know, good friends with the guy who did did that stuff. But I mean, it's it's like um, you know, with that aside, it's like uh, yeah, there, it was too contrasty, you know. And, and unfortunately, we didn't get enough footage while we were shooting the production of the suits. You know, because they did look really, really decent. Yeah, I remember them looking pretty, pretty good. And I mean, but, but that's the the philosophy that I approach with everything is to go back and look at what reality is and and utilize that as a starting point, a springboard, if you will. Who were your uh, influences? Who did you, uh, in terms of makeup effects? <laughs> like a lot of you know kids, probably you know back in the day, um, I, I started off a, a big Tom Savini and Dick Smith fan. Oh, uh, yeah. But then um, uh, through the years, I, um, I've I've grown and appreciated Dick Smith's... Um, Explain to some of the people who Dick Smith is. He, oh, he, yeah. he hasn't been in the field for uh, for quite some time, yeah, but to a, a big group of us, he would be, you know, the father of yeah. stuff. Tell, tell, yeah. tell him who he is. I, I mean, Dick Smith is, is you know, uh, the, the legend of uh, special makeup effects. I mean, if it wasn't for his generosity and his... Um, just his ability to put the information out there. I think more more so than anyone else. I mean, he his his generosity. Just if you were to ask him, he I mean, he'll talk to you like a normal human being and just and be the sweetest person in the world. And um, you know, I mean, uh, and, and to to write back to every single almost every single person that wrote to him. I mean, I, I thought about that the other day. I'm like, yeah. that must have took so much time. Well, I I, I had mean, Dick Smith's story. I was in tenth, yeah. tenth grade, I think, 
and uh, uh, Altered States had just come out. And that was a big deal oh, yeah. in terms of makeup effects because they, it's when they started using the air bladders mm -hmm. and, and the change-o stuff. And that was really the beginning of all that stuff. I had somehow gotten Dick Smith's phone number because he used to live in Larchmont you know, yeah. outside of New York City. So I called him up and he answered the phone. <laughs> and I told him who I was. I said, my name is John Vincent. I'm, I'm in 10th grade. I'm trying to do makeup effects stuff. There's no one around here to help me. I saw Altered States. I was wondering if you could give me some kind of idea on how I might be able to do that and how you did it. He spent 45 minutes with me on yeah. the telephone. That's giving me, giving me exact ideas, you know, descriptions on how he did it yeah. and, and, and what materials I should get, awesome. where to get the materials and how to execute these effects. Uh -huh. that he did. And I'm like, you know, I'm going, I'm drifting back and forth trying to write this stuff down <laughs> thinking Dick Smith is actually talking to me on yeah. the telephone. And, and it's not like he even, he, there's, a, there's a certain amount of purity there. I mean, he didn't like cut you short. No, he didn't say, very, oh, hey, kid, I got to go or whatever. And, he uh, seemed yeah. very enthusiastic yeah. about trying to help me. So for those who don't know, he did uh, uh, the old age makeup, a little oh. big man, mm -hmm. Exorcist, oh. Oh, yeah. Altered States, uh, The Hunger. Yep. Right? Yep. Yeah, he did The One Hunger. One of my favorite uh, vampire movies, Ghost, by the way. A film called Ghost Story. He oh, did... Right. Uh, <clears throat> oh my God! He did so many things. He started off at NBC doing a lot of TV shows, mm -hmm. and then worked his way into into feature films. But, but before uh, him, there were I mean, makeup guys usually tr treated things like magic tricks. Yes, like yeah. uh, mm -hmm. they did what? not want other people to yeah. know their techniques. There were trade right. secrets. Yeah. So so one guy might not know what the other guy was doing, but yeah. he would share his information. Like you you would know, hey, those are those are foam rubber makeup appliances. But mm -hmm. what is foam rubber? How mm -hmm. did how do how do you get that? What's you know? Yeah, the other guy's using gelatin. He's looking at your stuff, and and you won't tell him what it is. It's like, come on, you know. Right, right. And you come yeah. to find out, this is very complicated. Back then, making foam rubber was uh -huh. like six, seven different chemicals having to mix together, mm -hmm. and you know, no one would even know that stuff. And then uh, R and D. Remember R and D? Oh foam? God, yeah. It was a real simplified version <laughs> of, of, of three making, parts. Three parts yeah. making foam rubber, and that's I got that from Dick Smith. Mm -hmm. So you try the R and D, R and D uh, foam, and that'll work for you. Yeah. So. I don't even. I don't even think they make that anymore. No, that went under. No, yeah. yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> and then Savini, did you ever? Did you ever cross paths with him? Did you ever? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Not not, <laughs> not. not a good story. That's the look I, I see. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, someone well, you know asked, what it is. It someone was... asked me the other day if I ever crossed paths with him, and that was my reaction yeah. too. Because I, I don't know. I saw him at a convention. I, I did a like sort of fanboy thing, and he didn't really. No, no, he's, he didn't he, really respond. He's, he's very rude we have person. a lot of friends that have worked for yeah. Savini. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And he's actually, you know, you get mixed things. He's, you know, some people say he's very nice, and some people say you got to catch him on the right day. I think. You know. Hmm. Yeah. And other people say, because yeah, I know people, a lot of people that did a lot of sculpting, like on Day of the Dead and, yeah. and some of the other movies. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, we know a couple of people that yeah, worked on that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Volich and... In uh, fact, I, did I ever show you my uh, the little uh, the comic book thing that somebody... You have that? Yes, I do. You oh, got a copy really? of that? Yeah, yeah. I was, listen, this is... I was supposed <laughs> to, we, we, have a friend, we have a friend This part of, you might have to edit out. Yeah, I think so. Well, <laughs> we have a friend of ours that was a, was a sculptor on Day of the Dead. Uh, yeah. And he's, a, he's a, one of the best artists. And in fact, at the time, I think maybe five people had his ability yeah. out there. I think Steve Wang was probably at the top of the list. And, yeah. then, and then some other people, and, and this person was one of them. Mm -hmm. um, but he had done a comic book <laughs> of the people on the set Tommy of Tommy Dearest. Day. Tommy Dearest. Yes. So, yes. I have that. Oh, you got, I got to get yes, a copy I of it. I got to get it. Anyway, I was supposed to be a zombie in Day of the Dead. Uh -huh. Well, after that comic book came out, my friend, who I won't say his name, was not working on the project anymore. <laughs> and so I was not able to go down to Florida and be oh. one of the zombies. And I was very, very, very upset about that. Oh, that, that and I hold that against him to this very day. God. Well, I'll have to get you a copy of that. <laughs> oh, then, my because, God. Yeah. <laughs> well, God, that was so funny. Yeah. Well, you haven't seen the comic strip yet. I saw originally. I oh, saw okay. I saw the original one. The one that got him, it. got him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it was like, I go, you did what? You did this and you handed it out? Oh. <laughs> It's still funny, though. Good for bad, him. Bad uh, decision. Bad decision. But, oh, but a yeah. nice little piece of history. Thank yeah. you very much. Back in the 80s, it was gung... I mean, it was just, just the gung... Everything was gung-ho. Mm -hmm. You know, big shows going on. You couldn't have enough effects people working. That's and, true. And by the time I got out to Los Angeles, which is in the early 90s, it was, it was still going pretty strong. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Jurassic Park came out. 
Yeah, with a, I remember. And because uh, I was working at Dave Allen Productions at the time. T two too with another. Yeah, point. right, right, right. Yeah. And uh, everything. All of a sudden, everybody jumped on the uh, computer graphics uh, oh, bandwagon. Right. Boom! Dried up. Everything dried up. Hmm. Dead. Nobody was shooting. You know, my specialty was doing miniatures and and uh, creature effects, but in the stop motion animation mm-hmm. uh, realm. Uh, you're obviously doing the special makeup effects. Uh-huh. Now, I know it all took a huge hit. And the last uh-huh. big show that I ever worked on was that movie Freaked. Right. You know, and after that... This it is just, a great movie, by the way. Yeah, yeah, with some cool, cool stuff. And I oh, think yeah. everybody and their grandmother worked on that show. But it's so awesome. It's just such a great little movie. It's like, I don't even know if they could... if, if they you wanted. Gone, you should have gone to the rat party. I can't hey. imagine. <laughs> I could only imagine. It was at the, Air, at the Aeronautical Museum. But I mean, there. think of all the effects guys involved right. with that. And then just, I mean, like all the stuff in the movie. And then just the, the context of the movie. If they'd even be able to try and pull that off It cost a fortune today. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's yeah. just like a different time. And it's oh, like... Oh, my God, everybody. I mean, I mean the, 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 the shoe that I, I made the armature for... Was sculpted by Screaming Mad George. Right, I yep. have stories about him. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, I mean, everybody. I, I don't think there was one person at the time that didn't work on that. It had yeah. a hand in that movie. Yeah, I mean, Steve Johnson like, did. Steve yeah. Johnson, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody. Yeah, everybody yeah. did. I mean, there's such a, a ton of stuff in that. It's a, it is, it's but, a great so what movie. I'm getting to is it died. Right? Yeah. So how did you weather that storm and continue on working in the business when so many other people had you know went into doing other things? Well, it's funny when I when I first got out to LA, which I, I wish I had gone sooner personally. Uh, but I finally got out there uh, oh, after. Oh, it's, it's, this is fall. I have no yeah. idea how long this is. For. Wow. We have these. Here we go. <laughs> some backup. Yay! Please stand by. We are experiencing technical difficulties. Well, we were talking about the push-pull between uh, CG and movies and traditional effects. I know you're involved with uh, I Am Legend. Yes. The, uh, the Will Smith, uh, well, I Am Legend yeah. uh, adaptation. Now, that was going to be physical effects that you were working on? Yeah. Um, it's it, interesting story. I don't know if I'd necessarily call it a push-pull, but it's a, a prime example of how um, the, the digital effects have uh, an advantage over practical effects mm. in the sense that they can walk into a meeting or even after something's been done and go, hey, we can we can save the world, you know, or whatever. Um, I mean, I do see the advantages of digital effects. Uh, on that project in particular, all intentions always start off good with movies. I mean, I don't think anyone sets off to go, oh, we're going to make a horrible movie. Right. Um, I, I, I mean, when I first heard, you know, uh, about the movie, I, I was excited, um, and I was brought in at a pretty decent position where I was actually de- developing uh, Will Smith's makeup, his own personal scars and all mm-hmm. that stuff. Um, I won't get into that too much, the politics of how that went down. But I, I saw how the movie, when we were working on it, it, I mean, it went from effects house to effects house to effects house, and they were spending so much money. Trying um, to develop the look of the zombie vampire yeah. people. But right. I think, again, that, that was a, a, um, a, a more of an issue of um, one of those situations where it's... Um, uh, too many chefs in the kitchen and or you know too many opinions you know uh, being formulated without having a, a constant uh, direction one person saying yes no this is what I want six billion people on earth when the infection hit I'm a survivor living in New York City I will be at the South Street seaport every day at midday when the Sun is highest in the sky didn't do this. We did.
And so we're basically for months and months developing and coming up with all these different ideas of doing uh, translucent prosthetics and, and things where you see the muscles underneath and all this stuff that's never been done before. What are the transfers, the makeup transfers for that? Uh, well, I started off doing uh, Will Smith's uh, makeup because he's, he was supposed to be covered in all these scars from all his battles and where he's been bitten because he wasn't able to transform into one of the... Uh, um, right, so he's immune. Right, exactly. Right. So he has all these scars. So um, I had just gotten off of doing uh, 300 and before that I had done um, uh, the transfers, uh, had helped... Um, uh, with the uh, transfers for um, Passion of the Christ. Explain what a transfer is. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, there's a makeup process. There's prosthetics. And then what, there's a process we call transfers, which is um, sort of similar to, um, say, a flat mold. And as opposed to having a three-dimensional mold that wraps around someone's face, mm. these are, are done in a flat, uh, like, say, a flat plate. And then you, you, say, scrape a material in there and peel it out and apply that that is your prosthetic and it wraps around the contours on the person um and it's and it's painted and it has the scar image on it um it um, could you, you can you mean pre-painting i mean that yeah, could be done that yeah. could be done before yes um but the uh the process was something that was brought in on um uh, passion of the christ uh because jim caviezel's body was just covered head to toe in these scars and and the quickest way to for us to do them were to do them in these pieces and make these transfers as opposed to also another problem is with large pieces is movement when you start moving these things crinkle and and, and if they're joined together it's it's the, the same ana analogy of um, say a whole piece mask as opposed to having prosthetics broken up on the face right. when you start moving and it's all together it begins to crinkle and do weird things so the the ideology on passion of the christ was making all these individual pieces and also his 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 um uh brutalization uh christ being beaten and all this stuff is is a lineage it's it's a you know in stages so we had to produce these pieces so they can be put on and then and yeah take then, off yeah take on, on the next one right yeah. so i mean um with that said at the end i mean his body was covered in these things mm -hmm. um and they were uh i mean it was a, an ordeal and but i mean the, the process in itself um, you know, how, how long does it take to apply all that? Well, stuff? it depends on how much there, how many there were. Like I, I remember we did some test makeups before they ever went to Italy and shot anything. And um, you know, we're talking like if we were doing a head to toe makeup, I mean, it could be like four hours with four people working on them. So when they have to shut down or shoot something else while you're reapplying, yeah, I mean, it's just I mean, it would be proper scheduling and stuff. Yeah. Like, I never went to Italy, unfortunately. I, I would have loved to have oh, gone. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, it was one of those scenarios where they, they thought it best to keep me in the shop as opposed to sending me out mm -hmm. on location. But mm -hmm. I would have loved to have gone to Italy and done that. I bet. Yeah. Uh, but um, anyway, so the process I brought uh, to the, the movie 300 where uh, you see all the scars. Uh, like um, there's the one that goes across, uh, was it Leonardo or not, not Leonardo's eye? Mm -hmm. I can't remember the character's name. Yeah, I don't remember the character. Yeah, but they, all, they, all, they were all scarred up from battles and whatever. And um, I, we did, I did a one-man department. I did all the, the, the transfers and scars for that movie and also worked on some of the uh, characters and dead bodies uh, and some of the creatures as well. Um, then, um, then took that process over to... Um, uh, I Am Legend, which is with uh, the Will Smith's makeup. Uh, from that, um, moved over into the, uh, um, the, the uh, I guess we would call them what, vampire. The infected, yeah. yeah the infected, yeah. the infected character where we were doing um, uh, all these tests. And some of the stuff uh, I don't think we've ever even, uh, I mean, I have photographs of things that have never been seen that we've done that had like layering techniques where you would see the muscle underneath like a translucent layer of skin and we were just developing things that were um, pretty innovative. I remember seeing some of those images and I was really impressed with them and I remember seeing the CG in the movie and I was not impressed with that. Yeah, yeah I know. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, one thing, it, uh, it looked like CG, a red yeah. CG. Oh, like with the, the nutcracker jaw. It's like what? Yeah, I mean, and, yeah. and I didn't understand because I remember you telling me that um, at some point in the movie, in the process, they went from one to the other. Now, explain how that happened. Well, it was strange. I think I think what it was is again, um, it was, and I hate to say this. I mean, it was somewhere further down the line. It wasn't necessarily anyone took a look at like anything we were doing and and said, "Oh no, we can't use that." It was it was more, I think, indecision is what the indecision this is what caused the the problems and then to solve the problems they went to a whole different thing and just said okay we'll just finish it this way so they shot 
they shot prosthetic stuff for some scenes, right? It is my understanding that they did shoot some stuff, yeah. But uh, I know for a fact, after they were done with our shop, when we worked on it six months, they went to another shop, wow. into another shop, wow. into another shop. So I'm sure they've spent like a lot of money on the effects, <laughs> which is yeah. And then uh, after going to those shops, they went to the computer. Yeah, and then they turned around and did it with which computers. Which is incredibly expensive. Yes, and they may have yeah. actually rushed it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah. yeah because, because you could tell. could have looked better. Yeah. Could have looked. Yeah. A, I mean, the stuff we were doing could have looked better. Amazing. And I don't know why they kept to change the end of the, of the Richard <clears throat> Matheson story. Oh, God. Completely well, changed. I, I heard it was uh, Mike's uh, fault. Was it your yeah, fault? Yeah, oh, of course. Why wouldn't it be? We had to change. Yeah. We had to change the end of the story yeah. <laughs> because of these damn makeup transfers. And you know what? You know what's funny is actually I, I, I'm a huge fan of the Vincent Price one. I love that last man. That. Yeah. Last man. And that, and that and that kept the ending. I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was very yeah. true because yeah. he wrote the script. Richard Matheson wrote, wrote the script. script. Yeah. 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 This is my favorite version of that story. It's beautiful. Yeah. And it's like and then, I mean, along comes this. And I, I was, was like, shot in Italy. That was shot in Italy. Yeah. I was so excited. I was like, oh great, we're going to work on High Legend. And I'm like, yeah, Italy doubling for post. Apocalyptic LA. Yeah. yeah. But um, <laughs> Vincent but Price driving around on a station. I'd rather wagon. be in, in the post apocalyptic uh, Italy than present day. <laughs> I still think it's the best version, though. I don't no, I, mean, I do too. I, I do know. like the, uh, the Omega Man, which is Charlton know, it's, Heston, it's almost Omega. standalone. You know what yeah. I mean? It kind of is. But, it's a little um, different than, yeah. It yeah. is. But, uh, it's, but of, it's, it's of the 70s. Yeah. It's, it's Charlton Heston sci fi horror, is what it is. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's no Planet of the Apes or whatever, but it's, right. it's, it's up. But uh, so getting back to, to, to CGI and uh, the practical thing, I think, again, what it would have boiled down to is uh, indecisiveness. Um, I know at one point um, someone had the, the idea of covering all the... the um, the infected with uh, this white fallout mud. Mm. So they would cover their bodies with this white mud. <laughs> and it's like one of those ideas, it's like, okay, so some some chief somewhere came up with this great idea. Like, hey, oh, let's, I, just, I just saw this, I saw this I of Predator. Yeah. I saw the movie Predator, <laughs> and he and Schwarzenegger covered himself up in mud. Let's yeah. do it here. Well, it almost so, sounds like an Italian cannibal idea, too. Uh, yeah, this movie, yeah. so it, it, well, I mean, it looked, you know, it was an okay concept. Yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll just make this brief. I guess apparently they even went so far as to shoot test footage and I guess apparently they had a footage of all these infected uh, um, uh, <laughs> white characters white, white chasing, chasing after one Will Smith. Black character. <laughs> yeah, and, and they took a look at that and they're like, oh, yeah, that's we not gonna can't work. do this. Yeah, let's, now, this let's, is, let's have it take place in the South. Maybe they should be wearing some hoods. But, yes. but here, now here's the thing. Like, all they needed were like burning the stuff. But I mean, uh, and so far as to say, like, I mean, this is how much like money was wasted. I mean, we had produced, I think, over 100 hundred bodies foam polyfoam bodies and like in positions because they were supposed to be like a like all these bodies in the streets and they were supposed to have that burned mud on them mm -hmm. and they put it on there like it wasn't going to come off yeah. so they, and i remember the box was probably the size of this room wow. filled with all these bodies that they had to ship out to new york two of them two two boxes about the size of this place oh. and which and, is about a thousand square foot yeah, yeah it was huge they were huge i remember we we're loading up all these bodies in there all of them were now useless. Yeah, I mean, it would be. I, I would be interested to find out if they're. And you just can't around. take them and sell them on eBay. I was gonna say. I was like, what are gonna happen to all those bodies that they that they we produced? And man, it, yeah, I mean, just said, I mean, that's how much money kind of black. You go, you go drop them off at the goodwill. Yeah, I mean, donate they, them. But I mean, that indecisiveness yeah. seems to me is like one of the things, the hindrances in film. It, it needs to go back to the to the days of Stanley well, Kubrick. And well, it's, people a, it's who, a lack of a one man's vision. Yeah, or exactly. Per, or yeah. one person's vision. Right. Where right. where you know it's, it's focused small. Whether right or scale, wrong, it, it needs that one can't direction. By committee. We right. can't all be George Lucas. Come on. Right. Yeah. But I want to be George. No, you want to be George? <laughs> no. I don't want to be George Lucas. No, I mean, I, I like him. I just don't want to be him. All right. Can I, can I have his money, though? What? What? A measly little $4 billion uh, yeah, from that's, Disney? That's all. I mean, even just a fraction of that, I'd be happy. <clears throat> you know mm -hmm. what? We're, I was just talking to a friend of mine. This is a, veers off a little, a little, uh, a little different. That's okay. Path. Why not? But, but right. we're talking about you know surviving and how the business has changed. One of the things I used to do uh, to survive is sculpt for the toy industry. But a, a, a friend of mine who also did this, I was just talking to him the other day, um, and without, who was saying who it is, but this, this person, I never got anywhere near this kind of money. Mm -hmm. But he would sculpt something for, let's say, a Warner, or Warner Brothers, like a two foot tall uh, maquette, mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or for something for, for uh, these companies. 
And it, you know, it would be almost thirty thousand mm-hmm. dollars they would get. Yeah, and they would get. Um, I remember because uh, another friend of mine used to do that too back in the day, and they would get money per inch, like thousand dollars yeah. per inch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. some insane amount. But now it's like um, I mean, there's it, nothing. No, not, because nothing. now all they have to do is do a CAT scan and then output it. It's and all clean digital, it up. and Done. yeah, it's all done in China. Yeah, it's it's, all uh, done in China. it's sad, really, because um, well, I mean, uh, to me now, uh, I guess on a serious note, it's like w- when I look at um, what what uh, CGI has to offer in the lines of practical. I don't want to sound like one of those dinosaurs, like well, back in the day we used to make everything out of rubber, you know. What yeah, I mean, but yeah. the reality is, is something in front of the camera, something there, something practical is is inevitably better in the sense. Of to a certain point, I'll, I'll I'll agree to the to the point that digital effects is a tool. It needs to be utilized as such. It is not the end yeah, all be all. I, I don't it is see not it. there I don't for every problem of the two being married together. Exactly. Well, that's that's my you point. Know. Is but I mean, you can't use one brush to paint a whole painting. Right. You have to use the the exact tool for mm-hmm. the to make the thing look right. So well, if you're if you're going to pull off an effect for something. You know, and 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 if CGI is a part of it, that's fine. But don't don't use that as your your. Well, I remember your you know, watching Lord of the Rings, and even though some of the CGI is kind of dated at this point, but I thought that they were able to pull together the two worlds. Yes. Uh, because they really did a lot of large scale miniature construction, and they they had a lot of practical stuff mm-hmm. mixed in with the CGI. And I thought at the time, I thought they they, they pulled it off mm-hmm. pretty Plus, well. Plus, they would also, yeah. um, especially. Uh, in Fellowship of the Ring, there's a scene with a troll, and the camera is in and around, yeah. and the troll is fighting, and they're fighting, and it's a lot of um, handheld camera stuff. Mm-hmm. And they were able to shoot that in a way that, it, you know, it, it wasn't like it, you, well, you don't lock down the camera just because there's an effect shot. So well, it brings them trouble, together. That's yeah. the trouble Good. we had when I worked back in the day. Yeah. When you see a stop motion shot, yep. it was very rare we were able to even move the camera. Yeah, as a I mean, fan, it could, it could be done. You could smell it coming. We, like, oh, it, this is going to be something. Something's going to happen here. Look at the way they framed right, it. Right, man. We, we, and for, in order for us to actually just move the camera in the middle of a shot mm-hmm. was a, was an incredible ordeal. Mm-hmm. It was even before you know we didn't use computers or anything. Yeah. So. Camera was or motion control, almost, yeah. motion control. Yeah. Everything was like locked down. Yeah, yeah. you know. And so, oh, you bumped it. Oh, Jesus. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you, of course, we had to wait for two days, to, actually yeah. a day, yeah. for it to, to watch it to see, you know, what happened. Now, right. in terms of um, makeup specifically, I think one of the first examples I saw um, of this uh, combining the two was uh, Terminator Three. Um, Mm. Uh, Schwarzenegger's face starts to deteriorate. He's get blown up by a grenade or a helicopter or something, and you can see through his cheek, through you know, to the stuff underneath, oh, and, then, uh. and then to the be- so they there's parts of his head that they they took away instead of building up. They took away by putting beat, by putting yeah. green. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's yeah, green on his head, and then they could track it and put. But again, apply. that's a, that's a clever melding of the two. Yeah, because they also have yeah. makeup on his right, face exactly. too. Yeah. Um, have you worked on anything similar uh, that would use a green screen on a person to do subtractive uh, to aid in, in that sort of thing? Um, it's pretty specific. It, it, it is a little specific. Um, you know, we've we've played around with that before. Even on uh, um, your your favorite movie, The Fallen Ones, no. there was some stuff we were going to play around with when the uh, mummy uh, swallowed that stick of dynamite and it <laughs> explodes, and no. we were going to do this green screen on the side of the cap and all this stuff. Um, for one reason or another, I don't think we got to shooting it. Um, but uh, you know, I mean, to me, I think it's, it's, it's again just going back to even like with Pan's Labyrinth, you see that guy, the character working, walking with those legs, and I mean, it's such a clever mm. way to right, so subtractively he's... have a character or something that is like that doesn't look human. All right, I'm remembering now. So he's yeah. got, he's standing. Yeah, uh, it was Doug Jones actually. Yeah, he's yeah. standing. He's standing. Our straight good friend up. Doug Jones. Right. Yes, a good he's, friend of mine. He's got the green. He's got like green socks on. Yes. Right. Yeah. And then uh, at the knee, I think probably well, I at think, the knee, there was like something. Really thin there was something and, right. built out behind him. Right. Like so. So so the knees, sent, uh, the legs sort of bent backwards. That's what it was. Right. And then they just subtract his green they part of the front. The yeah. So so the legs look like they're bent in this weird awkward way, which is actually a very difficult thing to do um, mechanically. Uh, we have things called leg extensions. Right. Actually, I've done this on this um, alien abduction found footage film which I can't really mention because it's uh, going to be I, I don't know they haven't found it yet they haven't found it apparently 
<laughs> and we shot this like two years ago. Yeah? I don't know what's, what's happening. It's with that. there, but just we, yeah. they said it there, but no one's come across it. No, yeah, they took their whole movie and left it in a, in a camera, <laughs> and nobody uh, seemed to have found it. It'll, but, be, uh, it'll be on CNN. Geraldo uh, will be revealing yeah. it or something. Yeah. But uh, it's it's funny. Look, but we it's had, here in the vaults of Al Capone. We did these very complicated leg extensions, and uh, I mean they were they were problematic in some respects. I mean, but uh, you know the advantages to the green screen is it minimalizes the amount of mechanical hardware and stuff like that on your actor and stuff. Right. Um, I mean, uh, I've worked with Doug. Doug is an awesome guy when it comes to you know working with that stuff and just as a suit performer. What in was general. that project? It was it was in a morgue, right? And yeah. Um, I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to say about oh, that. Maybe not. But, okay. Well, I mean, just to say that we shot um, basically a, a teaser trailer for yeah. a good friend of mine, um, uh, Philip Eisner, uh, his project, um, The Other Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And uh, we shot a teaser trailer, and it had Doug Jones in it, uh, and uh, it was my first time working with him. Uh, a great guy and just a great performer. I mean, you can see someone who understands their body and how to utilize, you know, their their look and their movement. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a master at that. And um, just and then we had done a couple things afterwards, um, uh, something for Machinima, like uh, oh for Bite Me, uh, right. we did a little a promotional thing with that. And um, I, you know, still get web hits off of that all the time. So let me ask you, how are you yeah. surviving? In, uh, with the, in the CG world. That's an awful personal question. Yeah, I know, right? Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> professionally, how are you surviving professionally in, in the CG-oriented uh, culture in, of Hollywood? I, it's, it's like anything else. I think it's uh, you know, just adapting. You know, you, either you adapt or you become extinct. Um, I'm finding, like in the last couple of years, things have been more and more web-based. Um, we were just kind of uh, uh, talking earlier when I first got here that we were up for um, the uh, Internet Awards again. Uh, we're up two years in a row. Uh, first year, I think, oh, it was for Receiver through yep. uh, through Machinima. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this year, we were up for uh, Bite Me Season 2. Congratulations uh, on your nomination. Oh, thank so, you very much. Yeah, yeah, we didn't win, though. Oh, well. <laughs> hey, just be nominated. <laughs> yes, the... twice, two years in a row. I mean, that's. I mean, I, maybe next year I'll win once they figure out what the category really means. Oh. Uh, oh, oh, I didn't. Oh. Uh, yeah. wah, wah, wah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I just had to throw that in there. But, uh, I'm sure that'll help your chances. Oh, I'm sure it will. Yeah. I'll be, I'll, I'll be Put, you, put you right at the top of the list. I'll be curious <laughs> when I'm not nominated next year. But uh, so, so with all the stuff, I mean, it really, I mean, I, I been tailoring I mean I, I'm not one of those people that poo poo on something because it's gonna be on the internet I don't look at things like oh well it's not really a movie because we're not shooting it on film it's right. like okay we're shooting it on digital camera digital equipment but I mean still if you look at some of the quality and some of the some of the stuff that's coming out on the internet it might as well be on the big screen mm -hmm. there's no reason why not and everything is going towards that direction I mean we all know that at some point the, the you're gonna plug in your computer to watch you know television it's it's or vice versa they're gonna be inner yeah, it's happening. it's happening now right yeah. I mean so so to me it's like to me getting in on the ground level and and moving forward with, with that is hopefully you know a step in the right direction then did you ever have the impulse to scrap this uh, whole oh, absolutely. Uh, career and then yeah. go into computer animation or just completely no. screwing the whole thing and saying I'm out of here at one point yeah I mean we I think we all um, uh, you know it, it, it's funny it's like uh, uh, careers are much like a marriage it uh, it, it uh, could be good and bad and there, I think we all hit a point where we look at things and, and you know for one reason or another it's like well I just don't see why I'm doing this and I think that did happen for a little bit and then uh, it's funny it's a, I, I uh, I shipped everything all back east, where you know, back to I Rochester. Remember, yeah, yeah, yeah everything like that. my whole life, you wow. know, was all back, put back in the basement. I'm like, I'm coming home. That's it. I'm, I'm done. I'm gonna go Did to you Rochester to start, yeah, and start trying yeah. to make films. Yeah, and, stuff, and yeah. Was, uh, start the directing uh, mm -hmm. to get into that. And then uh, I just, it, the more I stayed in LA, the more I was like, even, even the, at the lowest point, I was like, you know what? I just can't. I just can't like. I just can't walk away from this, and it sounds stupid, but it's it's. Uh, well, it's not stupid. I mean, well, I mean, it, it's weird. It's like um, it's like even it's it's, it's a more dedication. Than a career. It's yeah. more yeah, uh, 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 yeah. People ask me that. Uh, how do you survive? And you like you said, you have to adapt. Yeah. I, I went from doing uh, creature effects stuff and, and special effects, and I still do it. But I went, I morphed into doing um, uh, production design, art direction, which stemmed from me building designing miniatures. It was one a natural progression. To uh, cinematography and and uh, shooting and directing. I mean, it's just uh, one thing leads to another. Yeah. One thing dries up. You just either adapt or you die. Well, it, I mean, not not even necessarily drying up either, but even looking at things like in a chronological order. Like I've always looked at things like, okay, 
um, I'm doing effects for somebody else. To me, okay, that's okay, mm -hmm. but ultimately it's always for someone else. Mm -hmm. Then I look at it as, okay, now my company's doing the makeup effects for this show, but ultimately we're still just doing the makeup effects for a show. Mm -hmm. Then the shows might get a little bit bigger. But in, in the end, still, you're just doing the make one aspect of it. Right. Then now, obviously, through the years, I've, I've been still, you know, I, I want to get into production, the production end of it, the directing. Yeah, you talk, we talked right. about that, and, uh, yeah. and uh, we discussed that your plans, you have uh, formed a small group out in yeah. California. That's a couple uh, of writing partners. Right, to start developing your own projects. Uh, Matt Gonos and uh, Matt Mastrella, two buddies of mine, were, uh, uh, we formed a little, little uh, production uh, company that we're going to get to. Uh, um, put everything so that uh, you know get everything moving this year actually on that so uh, we already have like two or three shorts written and you have, uh, can, a couple of feature ideas can you tell ideas. us kind of the ideas you're working on you want to keep those to yourselves well um, just right now we have to keep them a little little under wraps but um, I think between the three of us we all have a, a different take and different understanding well, kind of, are, of are you horror. sticking with yeah, I was going to say are you sticking yeah. with the horror genre yes, are you, are you, yes. Okay. right now everything is, is uh, very much in horror uh, the, the horror vein um, and it's, it's strange like I've mentioned my um, wanting to direct at other times and, and it's strange how some people either through fear or whatever have the knee-jerk reaction of like oh well, you just do what would do horror but ultimately I, I don't look at films as okay this is a horror film you know it has to have blood and this and that it's like no it's it's like to me a good film is a good film one of my mm -hmm. one of my favorite horror films is The Shining no because I mean there's something more, there's more something more terrifying about um, about uh, mentally terrifying someone than, than just showing them gallons of blood. That doesn't mean anything. Well, I think there's it a difference. You say, that about, you say that about The Shining, which has the, as the, the biggest elevator, gallons yeah. of blood As scene, the elevator you know? opens my mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But which people is, didn't go see that movie because of the gallons of blood. Yeah, it wasn't because of the elevator right. scene. <laughs> it's, it's because this man is going insane it's because and the, you're trapped. It's because of the naked woman that gets out of the bathtub. Yeah, that's oh, what yeah. saw that movie. Yes, before. definitely. Yeah. You know what's funny is like I remember my sister and my mother sitting flanking me on the right and left and them trying to cover up my eyes. That and another movie, one of the first ones, and I don't know if any of you have ever seen this movie called The Onion Field. Have you ever seen this movie? I've, I've heard of it. I think I've seen that. Uh, who's yeah. in it? Um, I don't recall, uh, but I, there's this uh, a shower scene where they're in prison and something happens and okay. I remember them trying to cover up my eyes on that. <laughs> but uh, um, I have to go back and see it because I haven't seen this movie in years. But, uh, <laughs> Must be horrible, but uh, yeah, I, I keep wanting to get back to see the Corpse Grinders again because I, you know, I, 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 I wonder if, if it's how I remembered it. It's I'm funny. still wondering. I'm it's wondering. Actually funny. Let's yeah. take let's take Johnny. Yes, that that sounds like a movie for the whole family. I, Just yeah. by the title, yeah. the Corpse, Corpse Grinders. Grinders. I, if anybody doesn't know what that movie is, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you don't. Uh, it's about the, these guys who uh, go around uh, making cat food out of people, yeah. and then they feed that cat food. To the cats, the cats kill the people, they go get the people, they grind them up to make more cat food. Well, that's, that's the danger you run into yeah. when you run such a, a company. Yeah. Isn't that the one where in the beginning they're like on motorcycles and they pull up and they, they go into someone's apartment? And I, I don't remember. All I remember is that <laughs> theme. Well, I, because I haven't seen it since I was The eight. funny part of this, there's a picture of the boyfriend, <laughs> the picture of the boyfriend on the uh, on the counter and his reaction in the picture, like they'll change the picture. Mm. Like she's on the phone talking and she says something <laughs> and then the, the, he's like looking up like at her from from the photograph. Right. You know, they just changed the photograph. And then when, he, when, when she's getting murdered, he's like, so the expression on the photographs that are sitting of her boyfriend are changing as the scene progresses. It's almost like they weren't taking it seriously. They, I don't think they were. I mean, it's like quite clever. I mean, it's a, hey, listen, it was no Herschel Gordon Lewis movie. Oh boy, yeah, God. yeah, he's still alive. Oh yeah, yeah we yeah. we did a actually yeah we interviewed a him a couple years ago. A few awesome. years back for yeah. one of our podcasts. He's a great guy. He yeah, is. He is. Yeah. Where do we go from here? Oh, uh, so well, yeah, so we ended up with you talking about wanting to do the production. Yeah, uh, going into that end of it. Uh, no, I mean the the, uh, the production is something. Obviously, if I've seen it, I, I've worked in the film industry since basically yeah, I was a kid, and it's like I mean I've seen it done good, I've seen it done badly, and, I, and I've seen it done so much where it's like I can do this, and I know I know my own sensibilities, and it's like I feel this is the next logical step, and I feel like it's time. It's it's time it has to happen now um and it's weird these last couple of years i feel this real need to push and push hard so um i'm thinking um this is the year you know for for things to be happening so so well, definitely I, keep your eyes out i wish you and, luck uh, yeah. I, I, we really appreciate you coming in and talking yep. with us yeah. i appreciate it as well you guys are a blast this was uh, not difficult at all no. you know, talking about yourself well, can you guys unchain me from the table here please i mean I, <laughs> 
Well, you know, we've been friends for a long time, and uh, I think that makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. And uh, sort of. So it's kind sort of. of. You know. Yeah, we we actually are, are more unforgiving in real life. We tease our. Oh, it's our, awful. Yes, it's awful. We we were actually very very polite to one another here. Yeah, that's right. Why. Yes, and we kept our. Uh, God, kept our, 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 our your pants on? Oh, what, what do you? No, oh, my pants are never on. Oh, okay. And his are off. Actually, he's wearing my pants. Yeah. We switched. We switched. <laughs> and Mike's gonna be. You gonna wear my pants that. next? No. I, well, it's underneath the table. That's oh. what I wish you'd keep your hands in myself. That <laughs> <laughs> brings us right back to where we were. Okay, well, uh, listen, I want to thank Mike for coming, and we're going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, Mind Rip. Yeah, okay. people uh, are, are wondering. I get the questions all the time. Hey, how's the movie coming? What's going on? So I thought we'd let people know. Um, we have about 20 minutes of the film uh, in the can, which means is we have 20 minutes of edited footage uh, um, that we're putting together. We're now in the middle of doing some more stop motion. The, the plan is um, we're going to be finishing up the first... Uh, 30 minutes of the film, hopefully within the next few months, I mm -hmm. would hope. Uh, and then we're going to take it from there and uh, see what happens. Sure. Good luck. Sure. I think, can't wait to see this completed project. I think it's going to be awesome. Oh, thank, thank you. you yeah. Well, thank you for your help with it. It'll oh, no problem. I, I want to help more, you know, in, in whenever possibility I can. Yeah, you know, very good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, and if anybody has any questions for Mike uh, that uh, they can email us. Oh, yeah, you can email us at feedback at maddogmovies.com. Uh, and the podcast address is maddogmovies.com slash podcast. And when I want to like advertise for you guys as well for this podcast, what, how will I go about doing that? How to advertise for us? Well, I mean, I mean uh, to, to promote the, uh, the, the where, podcast. Where are we going to hear this? Where are they going to yeah. be able to? That's maddogmovies.com slash podcast. Uh -huh. Weren't you listening? No, I, I wasn't. <laughs> no. Should you put a link on like maybe my website? Too? Yes, you can put it on your site. Okay. Uh, is that what you're... <laughs> Oh, going for no, how to find how to no. find your website? And that would be Multivision FX. Say your website one more it's time. It's multivisionfx.com. Very nice. M U L T I V I S I O N F X dot com. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, another episode of Mad Dog Movies. Music for this episode was provided by Keith Handy. <laughs>